us read together from Ignatius's autobiography. After the pilgrim realized that it was not God's will that he stay in Jerusalem, he continually pondered within himself what ought to be done. Eventually, he became rather inclined to study for a while so that he would be able to help souls. He decided then to go to Barcelona. Hello, welcome to the Barrio Gotico, the medieval, lively, wonderful center of the city of Barcelona. Here, Ignatius arrived after the travel journey back from Jerusalem through Italy. As soon as he got back here, he reached to Isabella Roser, a patron for Ignatius since his first stay here, and talked to her about his inclination towards studies. When Ignatius is dictated his autobiography to Father Gonçalves da Camera, we need to think that he had become a very savvy narrator. For as much striking as it might seem, this inclination towards studying had already popped up in the autobiography, even before his pilgrimage to Jerusalem. If you remember, Ignatius put some consideration about scholarship, learning, God as a schoolmaster to describe his days back in Manresa. Then he wrote about the lack of Latin as a con for a pilgrim who had to travel to the Holy Land. In fact, it was the same for any traveler today that does not, not know English, a uh, sort of standard international language. So, in a story where the idea of pilgrimage is pivotal at any step after Pamplona, as if Ignatius was very adamant about focusing his life on it, seeds of the relevance of studies were dropped in the narrative so to prepare us, the readers, to what seems a big change in Ignatius' way of living his own vocation. From a begging, then spiritual and reflecting pilgrim on his own, he will become a man of and for society. And studies will be the first step in this big turn. Why this savvy move by Ignatius as a narrator? Oh, well, the answer is very simple. As any novelist, he knew how the story was to end. When Ignatius outlined his own autobiography, the Society of Jesus had been founded and already turned into the first educative religious order of the Roman Church. Studies and society. These were the basic pillars of an institution that Ignatius would have crafted years after his pilgrimage in Jerusalem. And that would have been the remarkable result of a companionship that originated in Paris between students of the prestigious of university. It should not surprise then that when we read about the spiritual turbulence between Montserrat, Manresa, Jerusalem and Barcelona, the later Ignatius would have tried to weave a fil rouge between all of these places as a harmonic journey toward what the Society of Jesus was to become. Now, Ignatius is back here in Barcelona. What does he do? He finds lodging at Ines Pasqual's house and support from Isabella Roser, two women who uh, we already met and who played a crucial role in Ignatius' story. They were key figures of Ignatius' circle. Isabella remained so connected to Ignatius' mission that when her husband died in 1541, she conceived the idea of starting a congregation of women under obedience of Ignatius, a congregation of Jewitesses. Ignatius resisted. She made her case to the Pope. The Pope imposed it to Ignatius. She took her vows, but has the relation and obedience uh, uh, of Roser, uh, with respect to Ignatius, became problematic, the Pope allowed Ignatius to finally release her from her vows later. The congregation was over. The third key figure here in Barcelona was Jeronimo Ardevol, a Latin teacher at Barcelona high schools. Ignatius began taking grammar classes with him and, interestingly enough, he struggled. In his autobiography, he laments that he could not memorize and as anyone who have learned Latin or ancient Greek or any other language with declensions, conjugations and the like, one might imagine how difficult these initial studies could be for him. In fact, we need to remember that here in Barcelona, as later where Ignatius would pursue further studies, he was already an old 
student. Although in the society of the 16th century, there was not a system like our own today uh, with classes corresponding to a very precise age and cohort, those who normally took grammar classes in Latin were qualifiable as children, something Ignatius was definitely not at this moment. The autobiography traces this difficulty to memory, uh, to memorize back to spiritual thoughts, visions, and uh, that kept emerging in his mind uh, during the lecture of poor Master Ardevol. But this element tells us about the fact that studying and spirituality were always two pillars of his mentality. And while they initially struggled to get connected to and harmonized with one another in these beginnings, they will eventually come together in unity as a charism for Ignatius and the Society of Jesus. This reminds us about the fact that Ignatius' stay in Barcelona lasted two years, a long sojourn, in fact. During this period, he really dived into society through his major endeavor of helping souls. From one side, he won the support of many prominent people among the Catalan nobility who proved sympathetic with his works of charity. From another side, he worked as a reformer for convents of nuns, a ministry that the Society of Jesus would inherit as an important ministry of the early years. And finally, it seems that here in Barcelona, Ignatius made his first attempts at giving the spiritual exercises to others. Eventually, attracting what have been called three initial companions of him, Calisto de Sa, Juan de Arteaga, and Lopez de Cáceres, who in turn would be entrusted by Ignatius with the spiritual direction of other people, women in particular. We will see how this practice of the spiritual exercises could be a double-edged knife in the society of Spain in those years for Ignatius, after two years of declensions, Master Ardevol told Ignatius he was ready to enter studies of arts or philosophy. This time, uh, the time was up for him to leave the city, for although Barcelona had a Studium Generale, a university, there were in Spain universities with outstanding reputation, one of which was the quite recent Complutense, by then hosted in the city of Alcalá de Henares, and another one, the great school of Salamanca, where possibly the greatest theologians lectured. Unfortunately for Ignatius, the combination between the always intellectual theory climate of university cities and the suspicious eye of the Inquisition, which was patrolling over the movement of the Alumbrados and crypto-Protestants in those years in Spain, made the spiritual exercises and their success among people quite an interesting product not to be worth an investigation. We will see how this story goes next week, conversing with each other on the Rive Gauche in Paris, where the great story of all our universities truly began. Meet me at the College of St. Barbe. A few international students met there as roommates. They will become the first Jesuits. Greetings to you from Barcelona, and a very, very warm welcome to all of our pilgrims. While Professor Cristiano Casolini has spoken with you about the importance of this city in the life of St. Ignatius, I'm hoping to share with you a bit about the theme that accompanies this city for this week, and that theme is culture. You know about the importance of cities in the history of the Society of Jesus and that Jesuits chose cities for their schools because of the multiplier effect of both the greater good and the greater glory of God. Cities magnify possibilities because of the opportunities that they provide through bringing together a variety of human beings. Human gifts and talents thrive through this interaction, the intermingling that occurs through exchanges with one another. In other words, cultures develop and thrive when gifts and talents come together. 
when people meet each other and discover what each person is capable of sharing, cultures blossom and possibilities burst forth with energy, creativity, and delight. This is a week of pilgrimage where, in Barcelona, we're invited to reflect upon the gifts and talents that people bring to promote the common good, where creativity, teamwork, and effort produce cultural magnificence, celebration, and beauty. For example, in Barcelona currently, many, many people come to explore the Sagrada Familia, the Basilica of the Holy Family, the unfinished work of the Catholic architect Antony Gaudi. What I find remarkable about this basilica and its unfinishedness, it's that hundreds and hundreds of people have contributed to moving the building towards completion by sharing their talents and laboring in common for this strikingly magnificent cultural landmark. I see it as a microcosm of what cultures are capable of achieving when people come together in a spirit of cooperation and sharing. It's good, very good for us to reflect upon culture while we're pilgrims in Barcelona. So, how would you name your giftedness? What are your talents? Many people feel embarrassed by such a question because answering it makes them feel like they're being boastful or arrogant. I don't think such an outcome needs to be the case, however. To have the confidence of knowing what your talents are and to be able to articulate them is simple admission and nothing to be embarrassed about. There's a big difference between bragging and naming. In your inner heart, rejoice with the Lord for the gifts the talents that have been entrusted to you. Let that rejoicing be a source of intimacy, a great sign of God's love for you. Have you thought of the possibility of God's delight in witnessing your exercising the gifts that God has entrusted to you? I should think that every time we share our talents, God is delighted. When we exercise our giftedness, our talents, I believe that we're responding to divine love. In other words, when we apply our talents, that very application is a response of love from us to God, a response of that love that God has offered to us. Remember, Divine love is unconditional. There's nothing from it that we do to earn it, to sustain it, or to sever us from it. It's always there to be received. Remember, too, that divine love is never forced upon us. God does not demand that we receive his love, nor does God demand that we love him in return. The whole dynamic is invitation, and our response of love is revealed through our actions. We live and move in the earthly life by employing our talents. Part of the joy of being a human being is the discovery of talents, the cultivation of talents, the refinement of talents, and the sharing of talents. Culture invites these talents to interact with one another. There's nothing, nothing more beautiful than to see people flourishing in communion with one another by the sharing of their gifts. Think about a great soccer game, a beautiful theatrical production, a reverent 
liturgy with magnificent sacred music. The bad spirit always wants to bring us to points of comparison and to make us feel that the result is always one where we feel inferior compared to another. In such a position, other people and the gifts that they bring, that God has entrusted to them, become threatening to us. It's a great strategy of the bad spirit to get us to feel insecure through comparison and to focus on what others have that we don't have. The good spirit, however, wants us to recognize the skills, the talents, the ability that God has entrusted to us, and to magnify these by making use of them, expanding and deepening these things so that they become signs of beauty and mastery. Can you imagine what it would be like if instead of comparing our gifts with others, often which results in our feeling threatened and insecure, we delighted, appreciated, and even magnified the talents of those around us. My sense is that the result would be a marvelous cooperation and advancement forward in what we believers call on earth as it is in heaven. This week on pilgrimage, celebrate your talents and even better, Express your appreciation to at least one other person whose giftedness you admire. Name a talent that she or he possesses that you admire and love and appreciate. Isn't that a nice idea? Rarely do we articulate such appreciation for one another. I bet that you will discover that doing so makes you more and more aware of how much we depend on one another, and that very awareness is a manifestation of the mystical body of Jesus in our midst. Again, welcome to Barcelona. We look forward to seeing you next week in Paris.